You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 8, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, advanced rhinolaryngoscopy. Our presenter is Dr. William Dolan. He's a professor at the Medical College of Georgia at the Georgia Health Sciences University in Augusta, Georgia. All right. Well, we're very uh, pleased this morning to be joined by Dr. William Dolan. Uh, Dr. Dolan is a professor at uh, used to be Medical College of Georgia. It's now what is it called now, Dr. Dolan? Well, the the medical school is still called the Medical College of Georgia, and now the whole campus is called Georgia Health Sciences University. George, Georgia Health Sciences University. Yeah. Very good. All right. So, uh, and Dr. Dolan uh, gave a presentation a number of months ago on rhinoscopy, and uh, it, it, it was very well received. In fact, fellows have been asking, when is Dr. Dolan coming back to talk with us again? And so uh, we, we asked him to, to uh, come back for an encore, and uh, he's agreed to do that. So we're really grateful. Uh, just a few other comments. Dr. Dolan is a past president of the American College of Allergy Immunology, and as I mentioned, he also serves on the American Board of Allergy and immunology, so he's uh, clearly a leader in the profession and a uh, great proponent of rhinoscopy, and we will supply in just a moment. So welcome to Conferences on Rhinology, Dr. Dolan. I'm going to make you the presenter. Just click on the Show My Screen button, and we'll see your screen. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let's see if Good morning. this is... Do you all do you all see the image now? Okay. Yes. See it perfectly. Excellent. Oh, I have uh, no conflicts of interest related to this program. I want to make it very clear that most of the video clips that I'm going to show you were made by uh, Jack Selner, uh, past president of the college, and by uh, Jerry Kefke in Denver many years ago. Uh, Jack gave me his video collection before he passed on and what I've done is digitized um, all of these resulting in several hours of video. I have never previously shown these as a series of video clips and over the last few days I've learned a lot about PowerPoint uh, and the showing of video clips so if something weird goes on this morning well we'll just deal with it. Objectives are simple. We're going to discuss some of the unmet needs in outpatient rhinolaryngoscopy related to questions that you all asked. And then I'm going to spend the bulk of the time showing you examples of pathology, again, based on what you all asked. Uh, what uh, Paul Dowling did was send me an email, said that you all would like to see as much pathology pictures and video as is possible. That means that you may have to cut me off towards the end of this, uh, and so if we if we run too far over time, just say stop. Especially things related to surgery. This is what we're going to do today. Okay. He also said that you'd like to see pictures of patients with sinusitis, so that you could figure out who has bacterial, who has viral versus allergic or inflammatory sinusitis. So I don't know how to do that. Obviously, if you're up there in the nose and you see thick-looking, creamy pus just rolling out of the sinus, well, chances are very good that you're, you're dealing with infectious sinusitis. But I don't know how to tell the difference between bacterial and viral just by looking. And of course, if you don't have pus coming out of the sinus, it's not usually possible to enter the sinus, although sometimes you can. And then the next question was, do we use rhinoscopy to take sinus cultures? And if so, what is the technique? No, we don't do that. Uh, the nose is not sterile, and we're always entering through the nose, so we, we have never attempted to take sinus cultures that way. The next question was, how do I set up rhinoscopy in a private office? Uh, what brands and so forth? Well, your minimum equipment is an adult-sized scope 
and a life source. Jack Sellner always taught that. You don't really need the fancy, expensive video equipment. That being said, he always used it. Because you can run a videotape and show a patient what it is that you saw. And then you've also got a record so that if you see something that's unusual, something you haven't seen before, you can take the tape to an ENT colleague and play it back to them. I've been known to do that go from the third floor clinic where we are up to the fourth floor, find me an ENT resident and say, I'll bet you you would like to operate on this, wouldn't you? The ENT resident you know, sort of salivates and drools and say, I want the patient's name, make sure the console uh, comes to me, uh, et cetera. So it's nice to have the camera monitor and a video recorder of some sort. If you're feeling especially flush, they do make pediatric scopes that are about the size of a piece of spaghetti and are very easy to maneuver in the airway of a very young child. Although, you can get the adult scope into the nose of most children. The average costs of the scope, well, I haven't bought a scope in 20 years. And when I got to the medical college 20 years ago, they already had one. So I've never been involved in that, there are certainly companies that come to the college and the academy who would be more than willing to share that kind of information with you. Uh, people asked what kind of scope to use, what kind of uh, light to use. And again, I don't have experience with different brands, so I can't fairly answer that question. I can say that at the medical college for 20 years, uh, we have the same Olympus, uh, I think it's model ENFP2 scope, and that scope has served us well over the years. There are newer models with better resolution, and there are different companies that make this too. So some shopping around would be good, and if you do some shopping around and get some valuable information, that could be shared with the allergy community. That would be nice. How long does the scope need to be cleaned, and how do you do it? Well, in our institution, we used to clean the scope ourselves, and then the hospital took over the cleaning of all endoscopes of every kind. And they have a cleaning protocol that involves a special machine and special chemicals that just dare not touch the skin and so forth. Now, here's an unmet need. The ENT and the allergy community have never defined what should be the cleaning protocol for scope. I asked Jerry Kepke, an allergist, about that, and I asked one of the ENT people here about that, and I, I gather that there might be some fear or reluctance to define a practice standard. Now, knowing Jay, uh, who is not fear, who is not afraid of anything and has no reluctance to uh, go directly into politically challenging situations, uh, I would suggest that the ENT and allergy organizations really do need to get together and develop a practice parameter for uh, cleaning scopes, something that everyone can agree on and something that can form a standard out there in the real world. Are there regulations? Yes, there are. And um, our hospital keeps extremely detailed cleaning records. And out in practice, I would keep a book, uh, that I would keep a log book that shows that you've cleaned the scope between patients. Jerry Kepke can share with you what he does in the outpatient practice of uh, rhinolaryngoscopy. But here at the medical college, they go up to the cleaning room that's used for all of the endoscopes so that it's done according to their standards. My guess is a lot of it is joint commission requirements too. Well, I don't know. I don't know what I tried to find out what what the companies say about cleaning and I tried to find out about joint commission, but I couldn't get the info uh, in time for all of this. So getting a group together and coming up with some consensus guidelines might not be such a bad idea. Again, I tried a few years ago, and I got shut down. 
So the assumptions this morning are, number one, you've actually seen the previous lecture, because I'm not going to review normal anatomy. The second one is that you might have been to our website. You might have read the text from Jack's workbook there. You might have looked at the several dozen pictures of normal and abnormal anatomy that are there. You might well have downloaded and played with the URVL, the Virtual Lab app, that we made here a few years ago. It is free. It's a, there's a version for Macintosh, there's a version for Windows, and there's a version for the iPad. And it operates like a flight simulator going through the nose, but it focuses on normal anatomy. Maybe you've had a chance to watch all of the six videotapes that Jay and I learned rhinolaryngoscopy from years ago. Uh, Jack gave me, uh, well, loaned me the original master tapes of those videos, and I digitized them. The next assumption is that you're going to put up with me while we see some unedited video, and who knows what kind of technical challenges we'll face. And then lastly, please interrupt me if things aren't clear. Got that? Got it. Thanks. So here's a demo. Uh, this is a video clip of a patient we saw just the other day. The scope is going into his nose. He's six years old. And right from the very beginning, we're in the right side of the nasal, uh, right side of the nose. That makes this the septum. The floor of the nose is down here. What is this big old structure that we're seeing right at the beginning? What do you think? Inferior, Inferior turbinate. turbinate. Therefore, which meatus is this? Inferior. Inferior. Inferior meatus. What is this structure in the distance? Middle turbinate. Middle turbinate. And then the middle meatus is going to be back behind there somewhere being hid. What do you notice about the relationship of this septum to this middle turbinate? Yep, yeah, speak up a little bit. What do you notice about the relationship of this septum to this middle turbinate? It's aligned with it. It's yeah. Hard. They, they, they are, they're contoured with each other, suggesting that there's been a lot of pressure in there before we gave this child some oxymetazoline to bring about decongestion. Let's look a little further. I'm going to take the south route after looking at the middle turbinate a little closer, I'm going to take the south route back to his nasopharynx. Now, he's got lidocaine on board, so this is not hurting him. He's feeling pressure, but this isn't painful. Um, what is this structure back here? This is the septum here. What is this structure? What do you think? You may have to squint your eyes because of the moiré pattern. Adenoid. 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 That's the adenoidal pad. And so this hole over here, again, we're on the right side of the nose. This hole over here is what? That's where all the air has to go. Eustachian tube. That is the eustachian tube orifice. And he's got a lot of mucus, and he's trying, trying to swallow and deal with that. We're going to go down, 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 down. This is unedited tape. And so down here is the tip of the epiglottis. And we've got the laryngeal structures there. The base of his tongue is there. He started gagging a little bit here. And I didn't, I didn't want to spend a lot of time down there. So I had already done a thorough exam before I ran this video clip. So I got back out of there. And what I did was bring the tip of the scope back to the posterior edge of the septum. And this is the vomer bone. And then I'm going to put the tip of the scope up to look where? Okay, where's this? Where did I look for just a second? That was the sphenoethmoidal recess. And now I'm going to withdraw the scope. And I'm going to try to get into his middle meatus. But this is an unusually tight area. And this child's complaint 
was chronic nasal congestion without a lot of itching, sneezing, or dripping. And I suggest that he has very narrow nasal passages. Notice how these have sculpted up against each other. Let's look at his other side. The first attempt uh, was unsuccessful to get in. The second attempt will be a little bit better. There we go. And as soon as I get in, uh, the tip of the scope wanted to go up and look at his middle turbinate again on that side. And again, there is sculpting and contouring. He's got mucosal edema that has just been molding his septum and perhaps even affecting the shape of his turbinate. I can go down below and still get all the way to the back. One of the clinical questions we had was whether he might have adenoidal hyperplasia, but he had had an adenoidectomy several months ago, leaving me to wonder whether they might have not gotten all of the superior part out, which is sometimes the case, or whether there might be regrowth. But the adenoid is not occupying his posterior coina here, so I think this is mostly mucosal disease and we sent him out with a week's worth of oxymetazoline to open up his nose, followed five minutes later by a couple of sprays of luticasone nasal spray to start dealing with the edema, the inflammation that's probably underlying what's going on. His allergy skin tests were negative. So if, uh, if both sides get pressed on by the uh, uh, middle turban, or by the middle terminate, can it eventually erode through and create a nasal hole? You, you, yeah, you, you would worry. Yeah, you would worry. You would worry about a perforation happening eventually. Yeah. Uh, although I don't think I've seen that in a. I know I've not seen that in a child. So let's move on. This is going to be one of Jack's videotapes, and you'll hear his voice maybe. The scope is going in to the left nasal passage. Can you hear him? We can. Is it pretty typical to narrate the, uh, uh, the endoscopy while you're doing the movie then? Yeah, Jack could multitask very well, better than anyone I've known. And his setup recorded audio as he was doing it, as well as the video. So a lot of his tapes have that. What he did when he made the professional tapes for teaching was to suppress the audio and then just do a voice over it. But this is raw, unedited tape from Jack. Uh, he's put the, the scope into the left nostril. This is going to be the middle turbinate here in the distance. This is the septum. The inferior turbinate, what you see of it, is there. And the inferior meatus is underneath it. Okay, a partial turbinectomy is apparent. Somebody has gone in and chopped off the bottom part of this inferior turbinate. Not only that, they drilled up, well, they, they chopped a big hole in the lateral wall, so you can actually see maxillary sinus tissue there. And this hole is big enough that you could put the scope in there if you felt like you uh, dared to do so. Would that be pretty painful to the patient if you touched the wall of the sinus? I have never touched the wall of the sinus. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I, I usually don't put the scope more than a millimeter or two in there. In fact, I never have uh, because I just don't know what happens when you do something like that. This is a big inferior antral window. Where do the surgeons like to put antral windows these days with functional endoscopic sinus surgery? Middle meatus. The middle meatus. And we'll see an example of that in just a minute. Why the middle meatus? Why not just keep putting them down here? It's a lot easier. Because the ciliary motion inside the maxillary sinus. Exactly. The ciliary motion inside the maxillary sinus. We, we, learn, we learn stereotypically that the cilia like to propel mucus up and thus uh, it's better to put in middle meatus antral windows. But Jack is going way in here. 
I'm a scuba diver, and I, I like sticking my head into caves, and I like going inside <laughs> shipwrecks. And you know, Jack Jack has no problem with going way into this sinus. He's two or three millimeters in, and he's taking a complete survey. I suspect this person's um, sinusitis uh, pretty much resolved, although there could still be some mucosal disease. And indeed. There is, there are some lumpy, bumpy changes inside of this, which probably would show up as maxillary mucosal thickening on a sinus CT. He's just, he's just taking a real survey there. Let's see. Getting too much tension. This person has had a turbinect an inferior turbinectomy partial and has had an inferior and has had an inferior antral window put into place. Here's another one. We're on this is one of Jerry Kepke's tapes. This is the septum, so we're on the uh, right side. This is the floor of the nose. He's having a chat with his technician about pressing the record button, but it's already been pressed. Here is another example. Now, compare and contrast. This is the middle turbinate, and you, you ask yourself, where is the inferior turbinate? And the answer is, it's all gone. Uh, there is no inferior turbinate left here, and you can see a gigantic hole uh, into the right maxillary sinus. Uh, this person has had very extensive sinus surgery. Jerry's going to dive in there. Mucous membranes of the sinus. The patient is reporting complaints of pressure and pain. And Jerry is speculating that another sinus is involved, like an ethmoid or something like that. He's taking the scope way back. You might be able to see a tissue bridge here between the uh, left torus tuberius and the adenoidal pad. That suggests there's been a previous adenoidectomy with a little bit of scar formation. A synechium. Uh, here is an interesting variation of normal. This person doesn't have one middle turbinate. She has three. You'll see the third one in a second. Uh, this is one lobe of the middle turbinate. Here's another one, and there's a third one right there. And superiorly, they all join together. This is just a developmental abnormality that you will see sometimes. Does that cause it to take up more space so you're more likely to get congestion? It does take up more space. And so this person, uh, th this person would need intensive therapy to try to decongest the mucosa as much as possible in order to try to avoid surgery, but surgery might have to be done to reduce that turbinate. You, uh, again, it, it would be our philosophy to avoid surgery. Uh, of course, ENT might have a different opinion of that. Here's another patient. The scope at this point is in the right nasal passage. This is the septum over here. This is the floor of the nose. Therefore, this is the inferior turbinate. But we're going to go up in a second. There's the middle turbinate coming into view. And on some of these, Jack was able to put a diagram in uh, to help us uh, stay oriented. And there, there's some stuff going on over here. And there is a hole. It's hard for me to tell whether this is a surgically created osteum or whether this is an accessory osteum. The normal osteum of the maxillary sinus is hidden from view in rhinoscopy in a normal person, but there are accessory osteo which develop from time to time that will allow you to have a view into the maxillary sinus. 
And uh, sure enough, um, Jack knows no fear, and he's going to try to get the scope into this person's maxillary sinus. There it goes. This is an adult-sized scope being used on an adult, and he is able to get in there with no problem. Here's another patient. Uh, with the, uh, hold on a second, let's, let's do that again. I pushed the wrong button. What you got here is the left nasal passage. We're on the floor of the nose there. This is the inferior turbinate. And this inferior turbinate is curved uh, differently from how most people's are. It's an inverse curve. He's going through there. He makes a comment about the reverse curve of the inferior turbinate. And there's also a reverse curve on the middle turbinate. Okay, now this is another huge, beautiful antral window, the, the result of functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, the small antral windows will close up, but this is a big one that I, I suspect that this patient still has to this day. Are they pretty effective at relieving sinus disease, the antral windows? <laughs> if, if what the patient needs is ventilation, this will do it. Now, does an antral window get rid of inflammatory sinusitis, the kind that Larry Borish likes to talk about? Well, no. But it would allow medication to get in there a lot easier, I would say. Hmm. It's just beautiful. It's very healthy mucosa that he's taking a look at. And he's telling the patient, try not to jump. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, this time we're already in there, in the middle meatus. No. Whoops. Now, is, the, is the anesthesia pretty effective? The patient's not really feeling any pain here? Yeah, when, when it's done well, you know, the, the, the lidocaine needs to go all the way back uh, so that it's bathing the whole nasal passage. When it's done well, the patient will report a pressure sensation because lidocaine doesn't take that away. But it, there shouldn't be sharp pain. It, it's kind of like what you have to remember with suturing. The patient will know uh, the pressure of the needle but shouldn't know pain. If you have pain after you've put lidocaine in there, it just means that it didn't get it didn't get all the way back, or you haven't waited a few minutes for the lidocaine to take effect. Now, this is uh, this is an allergist who came to one of our courses in Denver and had some unusual findings, so we brought him over to the office, and this is Jack and I having a conversation about him while we're inside of his head. This is the middle meatus, and we're going in, in, in. Jack is driving, and I'm there making comments and adjusting the light source. And when we go into this guy, it looks like, it, it looks like we're down low, but this is the middle meatus, and we're about to go in there. What in the world is in this allergist's right maxillary sinus? Yeah. What do you think? Any nasal polyps? We weren't sure. Uh, they looked like they were fluid-filled cysts. And I'm wondering, you know, when, you get a, when you get a CAT scan report that talks about retention cysts in the maxillary sinus, I'm wondering if that's not what we were seeing here. Again, he's not a patient, he's an allergist taking one of our courses, and so we couldn't just take him down to the hospital and get a stat CT to, to, to uh, satisfy our curiosity. My guess is that these, these were cysts. Mm -hmm. It looks like doing well. 
he had had a history of chronic sinusitis and had had functional endoscopic sinus surgery by a, a master technician, big anthro window. Now, this is the same person. For whoops. Don't you hate it when a doctor says whoops? <laughs> okay. Uh, the tip of the skirt, this is the, the white out here is the septum. This is the adenoidal pad here in the center. This is the torus tuberius and the eustachian tube orifice. This is Rosenmuller's fossa. And you know the middle meatus is going to be up here somewhere when you see these landmarks. And so the tip of the scope needs to drive up. <coughs> this is what's left of his middle turbinate. And we know we need to be heading there to get into the middle meatus. It means maybe adjusting the focus, pulling the tip of the scope back. And there again is this gigantic antral window in the middle meatus. There's a string of mucus there, an unborn booger. And now the tip of the scope is going into this same sinus. And there are those two cystic structures again. Here's another patient. I keep hitting the space bar instead of the mouse pad. Um, floor of the nose, the inferior turbinate here. This is the inferior meatus. There is an antral window there. There is no natural ostium in this area. Now we're going to look up. This person has had massive surgery inside the nose. The whole middle turbinate is gone. All that's left is the stalk that it would normally hang down from. This is very extensive surgery. And in an area like Denver, this kind of surgery is not really a good idea because of the low humidity. These people get rhinitis sicca. They get uh, symptoms because their nose is so dry. And they need to carry saline around with them. The other consequence of this kind of extensive surgery is having a nasal passage that is so wide that you don't have resistance when you breathe in and out of your nose. Now, the perception of resistance when breathing in and out of your nose is an important part of our body image feeling well. And so if you take all that resistance out, people develop phantom nasal complaints and will complain bitterly that they're having trouble with their nose. You don't see extensive surgery like this so much more. Now, what they did after taking the middle turbinate away to give them access to the ethmoid labyrinth was pop off the tops of the ethmoid sinuses. You know what a crab looks like on the inside with meat inside those cartilaginous chambers? Well, this is a lot like that. Uh, the, the bone here is extremely thin. This is lamina papyraceae. And this ethmoid sinus has been opened up to the outside, as is this one and maybe another one there in the distance. This is, this is old school functional endoscopic sinus surgery. But you can see right into the So ENTs wouldn't normally do this kind of surgery today? The modern ENT people are not usually this extensive. They're, they're, they're starting to learn their lessons about doing this kind of maximalist surgery. I would guess that there might still be indications for doing it. But I would hope that those indications wouldn't be that common. Here is the left torus, and here is the edge of the right torus. Excellent. So Jack is walking the tip of the scope 
up into the sphenoethmoidal recess. What's left of the superior turbinate is there. Any ostium that's medial to the superior turbinate between that and the septum is probably going to be a sphenoid sinus ostium, and ostia that are lateral are probably going to be posterior ethmoids. Hey, Bill, uh, Bill, would this kind of surgery ever have an influence on olfaction? I mean, where's the olfactory nerve located in this? It's up there. The olfactory bulb is at the roof of the nose. And I would guess that the ENT folks are trained to very carefully avoid that area. I would also guess that if you get chronic infection as a post-operative complication, for instance, uh, that these patients would uh, report very unusual odors from time to time. Sphenoid, posterior ethmoid, sphenoid. What's left of the superior turbinate is there, and then he goes out. Of this um, small cavern, which is created by the lateral wall and nose and the inferior turbinate. Okay, so uh, here he's got the uh, the septum. This is the inferior turbinate. This is the floor of the nose. Of this um, small cavern, which is created by the lateral wall and nose and the inferior turbinate. Here is the polyp which is between the turbinate and the septum. You see that over the septum. Okay. Here is a, it's a little hard to appreciate even when you squint, but there is something occupying this space here. This is, this is the left nasal passage. This is the, the middle turbinate and the middle meatus. And there's this tissue which is extending out or over the inferior turbinate and proceeds. It is hanging over the inferior right. turbinate, and he's trying to trace it back to its origin. Now, what is this? If this is the lateral wall, and if this is the septum, what is this? You got a perforation? Looks like it. It's the middle turbinate. And this is a very nice example of how you can get confused here, because it looks like you have a large ostium with maxillary sinus to the left, but that's actually a perforation in the septum. See what he means? Sure. If you didn't know that this is the left nasal passage, you would swear that that's an accessory ostium of the maxillary sinus in the middle turbinate, at the middle meatus. But actually, this is the middle meatus, this is the septum, and there's a perforation there. So whoever said perforation gets an A for the day. Now he's tracing back. He's trying to see where this polyp is coming from. Okay. And I don't think that one is going to be traced. It, if it's coming from the middle meatus, where could it be coming from if it's coming from the middle meatus? Which sinuses? Which sinuses drain into the middle meatus normally? Maxillary. Maxillary. What else? Ethmoid. Ethmoid. Ethmo uh, anterior ethmoid. And? Sphenoid. No. Sphenoid, sphenoid drains into the sphenoethmoidal recess. The posterior ethmoids drain into the superior meatus. What sinus is left, the big one, in front of your head? Frontal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, frontal. So if this polyp is originating in the middle meatus, it's either frontal, maxillary, or, or anterior ethmoid. However, it's possible that it's originating in a sphenoid or a posterior ethmoid, and the stalk is traveling through the middle meatus <coughs> and out into the nasal passage itself. That's why he's diligently trying to trace the origin here. Uh, when, you know, when in doubt, you can just get a CAT scan and find out. Small cavern, which is created by the lateral wall and nose and the inferior turbinate. Here is the pump, which is between the turbinate and the septum. You proceed up over the septum, or over the inferior turbinate, and proceed superiorly and posteriorly. And you can see it comes from the middle meatus. That is the middle turbinate. 
And this is a very nice example of how you can get confused here because it looks like you have a large osteum of maxillary sinus to the left. But that's so that's a really nice video clip. Hmm. Here's another one. You all wanted to see pathology. You wanted to see sinus disease and sinus surgery. We can do this. <laughs> My guess is that this is the septum and that we're on the right nasal passage. And there's all kinds of uh, structures in here. And the question is, is this a polyp or is this the middle turbinate? There's something there. There's something there. This if, you spray, <clears throat> if you spray oxymetazoline on a polyp, does it shrink the way mus uh, mucous membranes shrink? It does not. It doesn't have erectile tissue. Mm. So what Jack, Jack was very, very good at spatial relationships, and he was very dexterous. And so he was able to do endoscopy with one hand and a video camera suspended from the ceiling. And with the other hand, he could put a cow swab or something in and actually push on structures. A nasal polyp is going to be squishy, and a turbinate is going to offer resistance because it's got a bone in it. Um, in this particular instance, we're looking at uh, a little turbinate and a large structure which comes down and seems to uh, coalesce with uh, the uh, mucosa of the septum, and this could be a snicky, but it is not. It's a, um, turns out to be a uh, fairly uh, easily to demonstrate uh, polyp. There he goes. Let's see how you can uh, insinuate the polyp away from the septum. Uh, this is all a polyp. Then uh, look up above here, and you can see that the middle terminate itself uh, gives a little bit, but there is some polypoidal nature to this. It is somewhat swollen, but that's definitely a terminate. And then, okay, you all right? <laughs> 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 sneezing, and you will see that there's a problem associated with the intervention of the mucosa. And that's why it's really good to stand to the side of the patient when you do these procedures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> different kinds of polyp. Notice the vascularity that you can actually make out here. Again, this is from the middle meatus. Now, uh, watch this polyp. Notice the uh, consistency of the tissue is really very different from the uh, mucosa that surrounds it. This is a typical uh, polyp oil extension from the middle meatus. Come up over the interior turbinate and proceed posteriorly. And here's that same patient earlier who has the triple clefting. Yes, three distinct populations associated with. Okay, still in the middle meatus, another patient. She had turned up. Well, I think you should leave it on there because uh, there are two different kinds of tapes for two different purposes. One is for a permanent record, and the other is. And here's somebody else who's just loaded, packed with nasal polyps. Nasal polyps aren't, aren't subtle. Uh, even a first year allergy fellow can uh, look up there. Now, when I was a first year allergy fellow and had not learned rhinoscopy yet, I was looking in people's noses all the time, and I am certain that I put people on nasal steroid therapy and did sweat tests on people for nasal polyps that actually were middle turbinates. Uh, rhinoscopy changed all of that. When you actually go up there and look with the camera, it's very easy to tell if somebody has clinically significant nasal polyps. Th these are not subtle. So you really can't do an adequate nasal exam without a rhinoscopy, can you? You can't do a mostly thorough one. Now, mind you, uh, we've gone into patient and family-centered care in the last few years, 
and we are now considered a pain-free children's medical center. So back in the day, I didn't think too much about having a mother hold a two-year-old in her lap and just throw the rhinoscope up there. Sure, the child's going to fuss, but they fuss during spinal taps too, and then it's all going to be over with. We don't do too many two- and three- and four-year-olds anymore as a result. The, the hospital would like for them to have conscious sedation for that, so we have ENT do it. But back in the day, I did a lot of those. Now I'm trying my best. It, usually the question with a two- to four-year-old is, do they have big adenoids or something? And I like to think that if we've got some decongestion, and if I can see all the way back into their nasopharynx, I can at least answer the question of whether they have giant adenoids or not. But I'm not doing a truly thorough exam on those folks. And so I do feel a little guilty. Yep. So I want to try to find that. I think you could see these nasal polyps if you did a fairly careful speculum exam. These are not so. And again, this is live audio. He's talking about trying to put a cotton swab in there, for, which for some reason I can't do. Okay, let's move towards the back. Now, this isn't the sphenoethmoidal recess. We're in the nasal passage, and there's this big old thing occupying the nasal cavity, and it looks like it's coming down from above. Um, I'm starting the nose uh, over here on the right. Carrying the scope immediately above that. It's coming from way up above. And you can see the uh, inferior surface of the middle terminate. Which is here. And it would appear that this uh, uh, object has its origin uh, superior and posterior uh, to the um, middle terminate, and certainly immediately. Um, it's likely that's a giant that that's polyp. Not adenoidal tissue, which I don't think it is. And assuming that it's some sort of a polypoidal structure, which is sitting in the ball, that certainly could account for uh, disproportionate uh, obstruction in the right side of the nose compared to the left. Remember, rhinitis is itching, sneezing, dripping, and congestion. And the congestion is often enough there but they're mostly telling you about the itching, snipping, uh, sneezing, and dripping. If somebody only wants to talk about blockage or congestion, you've got to assume that there's something blocking their nose. It, it could be an anatomical defect. It could be mucosal congestion. It could be adenoids. It could be a polyp. It could be a big old cancer in an older person. The right side of your nose is where you He's have He's talking problems. to the patient. Well, this is sort of like somebody put a plug in there. Right. Now, I want you to Can the patient see this on a video screen while it's happening? Yes. Uh, you can, a, a patient can talk all during the exam, and I encourage them to. Uh, you, you do want them not to swallow while you're down on their larynx, because if they do, uh, they'll hit the tip of the scope with their epiglottis, and that'll induce a gag reflex, yet another reason to stand off to the side. And you want to pull the scope out of there until the gagging is done. And, you know, if it's a guy, you talk about baseball. If, it, if it's a lady, you talk, well, you can talk about baseball to women, too. Uh, that was going to be sexist. Um, you, you do not want to induce a gag reflex because it, it will make them vomit. Um, but you can talk to the patient, and they can talk to you all during this exam. That's going to be a problem. You couldn't move any other way like that. Now I want you to breathe in through, I'm going to hold this left side of your nose so that you're breathing. Okay, he, the he's blocking the left nostril and he's asking the patient to breathe in and out through this right nasal passage okay, which is so blocked. I want you to suck air in gently first. Close your mouth and suck air in gently. Now blow it out if you can through that area. Isn't that awesome? Well, you're doing just fine. You're exactly what I want you to do. Now just stop and take nice breaths. You die of air starvation. It's like a one-way <coughs> pole, Yeah, this is a giant pole. Uh, this is the reason. 
he's saying, this is why your wife is obstructed. The patient's husband is standing there next, watching this whole thing on the video monitor. Uh, and I want you to take a breath in now. Now, out again. Try to blow through that nose. OK. She has a ball valve uh, polypoidal uh, structure, which is obstructing the nose. And uh, if that wasn't there, I think she would uh, breathe a lot better. Now let's look at this from the left side of the nose. It's nice and normal. Middle terminate looks OK. She does have some deviation of the septum. Yeah, the septum in this patient is deviating over to the left there. And he's going to go around. She allows us pretty nice excess all the way into the posterior pharynx. And now, remember the polyp is on the right. He's in the left. This is the inferior turbinate. This is the top of the soft palate. This is the septum. And now he's able to view the rest of this polyp, which is occupying a good portion of her nasopharynx. As you approach the posterior pharynx, I'll be there. <laughs> now this polyp has extended itself uh, almost uh, over to the uh, orifice. This is the orifice of the left eustachian tube. This is the torus tuberius, the adenoidal pad. So if you can kind of turn to a duct, you can see how as she swallows there, it comes in contact with the orifice. It is beginning to extend into the coina on the left side of the nose and could be anticipated over time will obstruct uh, the entire nasal pharynx. And the thing that's crucially important about this is the irregular edges of this uh, polypoidal structure. Uh, one could not tell for sure that this was not an involuted polyp, and also in the differential would be a carcinoma. Uh, as it turns out, surgical removal of this polyp identified it as a single polyp. It had to be cut into three different segments in order to be removed. Uh, it had extended into the right uh, coena, was in contact with the middle turbinate, approximately 20 to 25 percent into the nasal vault, uh, and was effectively obstructing it, as we saw on the right side of the nose. It seems to me that this is a classic example of why it's so important to look in the recessed areas of the nose that cannot be examined by routine procedures. Isn't that impressive? It's amazing. Okay. Moving on, if this is the right nasal passage, and that's the septum, and that's the inferior turbinate, what is this projecting into the nasal cavity? Mm -hmm. That's the middle turbinate. What is this mass? It is adenoid tissue. Here's one of ours. Uh, this, this is one that we got here a few years ago. Again, the septum, the floor of the nose, uh, the inferior turbinate, and a giant obstructing adenoid. This was a 15-year-old uh, young man who was having trouble playing football because every time he put his mouthpiece in to protect his teeth, he couldn't breathe. And there, there was a concern that it might be allergy. Here's something else you won't see too often. Uh, again, this is one of ours. This is the floor. This is the right nasal passage. This is the floor of the nose. This is the septum. This whole area here really ought to be open. This is the adenoidal pad in the distance, and that's the torus, the right torus varius. What's going on here? What's the name of the structure that's the transition between the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx? The coenal Yeah, it's the coen the posterior coena. And if the membrane were intact, you would say it's coenal atresia. But there is a hole there, so you can say this is coenal stenosis. And th this person uh, had trouble breathing out of the right side of their nose all the time. And 
if they generated enough nasal flow, they said they could whistle. Huh. <laughs> kind of like a, a flute built into the back of your nose, huh? Wow. This is, this is a nice surgery for an ENT person to do. They can fix the patient right up and they'll be fine in the recovery room. Wow. Now, this is a different one. This is another this is another adolescent male who has nasal blockage. This is one of Jerry Kepke's famous patients. And if you've been to his course, you know what you're about to see. Does anyone know? Anybody? I'm shaking their heads. No. This is the floor of the nose. This is the septum. And there's this in the distance. Is that an adenoid? What vascular tumor do adolescent men get because the tumor is steroid is testosterone sensitive? Mm. This is not adenoid. It's smooth. It's totally smooth. It's highly vascular. It is testosterone sensitive, and it is occupying this young man's nasopharynx. Okay, so if it's got blood vessels, what's the Greek? It's angiofibroma. There you go. It's an angiofibroma of the nasopharynx. <coughs> this thing has to be surgically embolized in order to deal with its vascularity, because if you just take it out without previously embolizing it, uh, they will bleed to death on the operating table. And uh, Jerry was able to confirm this preoperatively with uh, a sinus CT. Okay, moving down. A little close here, portion of the time. The uh, posterior parenteal wall is normal. This is the epiglottis. We're trying to look down into the larynx because this person has dysphagia. But what is pushing the epiglottis back against the posterior pharyngeal wall? What is this structure? The lingual tonsils. The lingual tonsils, exactly. This person complaining of the sensation of a lump in the throat had a lump in the throat. Also, a traditionally difficult surgery that has to be done very carefully. Another patient. We're looking at the vocal cords. These are the true vocal cords there. And what is superior to the true vocal cords? The false vocal cords. Oh, yeah. It just seemed too obvious. <laughs> now, this person is trying to say E, but her voice is very abnormal. What is she doing with her false vocal cords? Adducting them? She is adducting her false vocal cords in order to phonate. And since her voice sounds abnormal, you would say she has dysphonia. And since the Latin name of the false vocal cords is what? They are the plique ventricularis. Her diagnosis is dysphonia plique ventricularis which is a diagnostic term that's never been really translated into English, and so it's that way in all the books. Here's somebody else. There's some contact points here. What's your next conference? Whatever comes. What does this person probably have? Right there and there. A little hard to see. These are nodules. However, you would want an ENT colleague to look at them to make sure that they're benign. They're coming together. This might be somebody who, who screams a lot at, at basketball games, like, you know, like Rebecca Buckley or something. <laughs> Here's someone else. This is somebody who had a muffled voice. And the voice is muffled because there's a big old mass uh, coming out of the larynx and hiding <coughs> the vocal cords. Uh, 
Now, I, this is someone I have seen. This is someone who Jack saw and ran this videotape. We sent this patient to Brian Spofford, an otolaryngologist in Denver, because we didn't know what this was, but we didn't like it. And we figured this was why the patient's voice was muffled. Well, Brian didn't know what it was either. But being a surgeon, he took it out and had pathology look at it in the operating room. What well, turned out it was a benign schwannoma of the larynx. And so this patient postoperatively was just fixed up. Here's somebody else. This is subtle, but look for vocal cord motion. You know, normally when you breathe in and out, the vocal cords move back and forth. And normally the larynx yeah. is symmetrical. Then out. Now I can say. Deep breath. Uh, deep breath. Now pant for me. It's subtle, but there is abnormal vocal cord motion suggesting a paralysis. So uh, we've spent just about all of our time available. You've seen lots of examples of pathology. We, we have to uh, pause for a minute in memory of Jack Selner, who is still teaching all of us, teaching our next generation, and who we have to thank for being so diligent to have made all of these recordings so that we can take a look at them today. Thank you for your attention. and. I can answer questions until Jay says we need to turn the system off. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, Bill. That was that was amazing, um, and I will. Uh, I'm going to take over being the presenter again so that you can see us. Here we are. Uh, I'll I'll second your comment about Jack Selner. He was an amazing person. He was also the founder of the Aspen Allergy Conference, which our fellows have gone to uh, fairly often. It's one of the premier allergy conferences held each year in, uh, in Colorado in July. Jack Sonner was uh, the founder of that conference, and uh, for many years, so uh, it was the person who introduced everyone and welcomed us. And, and he, he was just a special person. I, I really uh, grew to respect him immensely, as obviously he did also. <clears throat> any, uh, any comments or questions from the group uh, about this uh, presentation? And if you're in the audience and you want to ask a question, just uh, click the little hand and get a raise. Any any thoughts? So, um, in terms of the actual practice of rhinoscopy, uh, what, what portion of the patients you see with nasal complaints would you say that you do rhinoscopy in? Is this like something everyone gets, or is it a small percentage? Or what would you say? I'll share a secret with you. Uh, our fellows have not been as interested in rhinoscopy as we were when we were fellows. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to gently explore those barriers and um, let them know that if they want to be credentialed with rhinolaryngoscopy as part of exiting our fellowship, they need to be doing more exams than they are. We do, we do we do one or two a month these days, which I think is far too low. Uh, Jack would be appalled. He would give me a lecture for letting them get away with that. Uh, when I'm seeing a patient with a resident, I do the procedure. I don't, I don't bring a fellow in uh, to do a procedure on a patient that the, that the fellow hasn't seen. But I'll let the resident have a pass or two with the scope, too, because this is not difficult. Back in the day, Back in the heyday of rhinolaryngoscopy in the late 80s, we didn't do everyone, and Jack Selner didn't do everyone. What we did, if somebody had nasal blockage predominating as a symptom, well, that's a direct indication. If somebody had uh, laryngeal issues, thinking, coming to us, thinking it must be <coughs> an allergy, that was a direct indication. Somebody who had just had sinus surgery and was still having symptoms, we wanted to see what was there that might still be producing those symptoms. Um, we don't do rhinoscopy as often as I think we should be in a training program. I think the fellows ought to be doing one or two a week. 
Well, I, I think you probably need to in order to become proficient with what you just showed us. Uh, and in terms of strategies for doing this, do you usually just do it when they come in for their first visit, or do you schedule them for a return visit specifically for rhinoscopy, or how does that work? The way Jack did it was to do it as part of their first visit. He had a machine set up in his office, uh, a human machine. Mm -hmm. So he could go on the intercom and say, scope, room three. And he would leave the exam room and go see another patient. A nurse would take the patient down and would anesthetize them and get them ready and explain the procedure. And she would go, scope, ready, on the office intercom. He would finish up what he was doing with the patient because he got about 30 minutes to do the procedure with the light at home. He would go do the scope. He would talk all during the exam. The nurse had seen hundreds of these. So the nurse would play the videotape back and explain it to the patient while he went and saw another patient. And that made it very easy to do. Here, I like to do it on the first visit as part of that. But of course, as you all know, somebody coming in for a first visit, they're going to need skin testing done usually. They may need lung function tests done before and after bronchodilator. We do a lot of asthma education, and that can occupy most of the morning or most of an afternoon. So on occasion, we will bring them back. Uh, the the six-year-old who we let off with is, a, is one that was done earlier this week, and that is somebody that we brought back for rhinoscopy. Definitely, definitely something to think about. I, I think all allergists ought to seriously consider doing adding rhinoscopy to their repertoire. Uh, Dr. Dolan, I really want to thank you for joining us today. This has been a fascinating presentation. We really appreciate it, and uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks for the invitation, and y'all have a great weekend. All right. So we're going to stop there. I think our next conference, we don't have another conference now, so that's the end of our presentations for today. This has been Conferences on Mine Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. <coughs> Kansas City. Have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.